So I'm just going to give, as I say, a few background um, slides to just to give a, a context to perhaps why this challenge, um, why the government has uh, risen to trying to address it, and hopefully to kind of do it uh, at the end to start introducing this specific call. So obviously, um, whilst there might be a significant debate about the precise definition <coughs> of food security, I think it's widely held that actually to be food secure, there are a number of pillars that need to be um, addressed. Some of them more to do with availability and access, more to do with utilisation and um, stability resilience. And, and therefore, in, in, in the work that we're doing, obviously we would be wanting people to take that very appropriate and broad definition to food security to ensure that the UK population is food secure. But what kind of led to us being in this position of trying to try and drive forward this new strategic priority fund? Well, when one looked at the metrics, it was clear that from a UK perspective, you know, we were a long way short. And yet, many of us in the room have been working on projects all around the world trying to fix food systems in Africa and uh, Australasia and South America. And yet, in the UK, we did not have a food system delivering for our citizens. So, here's a few kind of background figures which I think is, is useful um, to highlight. One, in terms of the actual... Diets changing in the UK, but sadly, the data, things from like the National um, Diet and Nutrition Survey, suggest that these diets are changing for the worse. The amount of sugar being consumed is going up. The challenge of eating five vegetables a day is not being met. The amount of fibre being eaten is dropping. So therefore, whichever metric you want to use, it is clear that without some form of change, some form of disruption or transformation, the UK situation is likely to get worse than it is currently. What does that mean? Well, what it means is some pretty staggering and rather sad statistics. The statistics being that one in seven deaths in Britain every year are diet-related. Two-thirds of the adults in the UK are overweight or obese. And the conditions often associated with that, like type 2 diabetes, is actually increasingly costing the NHS vast amounts of money. You can see the statistics at the bottom there in terms of chronic the disease that accounts for 6.1 billion of the annual NHS spend. And as I said, on the basis that these numbers are likely to get worse rather than better, that was the impetus which kind of enabled people to suddenly get the government through the Strategic Priority Fund to respond. Clearly, it's unfair to just pick on the UK, and this paper came out in Lancet just this year, and this paper illustrated this global phenomenon of whether you're looking at actual mortality or dailies, the numbers are quite staggering, and as is the case with anything to do with food, you immediately get the headlines. And the headlines being here, that earlier this year it was determined that even the NHS was stating that poor diet now killing more people than smoking. And in the BBC there, effectively, if you look around the world, five lives are shortened every year. Uh, sorry, the, the diet cuts one in, the lives, one in five lives short every year, that's from the DALI um, statistics. So it, it, it's clear that we have a problem both at the global scale and at the UK scale. So that's offering human health. So you might turn around and say to yourself, well actually if the human health is looking, fi uh, looking in that situation, then what does it mean in terms of planetary health? And if we look at planetary health, we have a similar range of statistics whether it be to do with IPCC reports talking about the role that food has on climate change, whether it talks about the amount of land that's used in the UK for various parts of the food system, whether that be meat and dairy or whether it might be um, large arable land. 
and at the bottom there, something like soil erosion, which is increasingly becoming importantly recognised and, and money is being invested in that space. This range of statistics also don't look good. So the sad thing is, and again, some people might say, wow, you're painting a doomsday picture and uh, you know, have you got any good news? But the good news is the money, actually, to do something about it. But the bad news is the statistics for human health and planetary health are not looking good, whether you're talking about the globe or whether you're talking about humans. Here, this is what we should be eating from the Eat Well Guide of a, a range of government departments generate that. And that's what globally, and we put globally there because largely the food system is a global system where we're importing and exporting loads of food from the UK. But you can see there's a bit of a mismatch between the kind of the dietary guidelines and, and the production. You know, challenge perhaps number one is the fact that actually how do we get the production system, the production itself, the retail, the supply chain, the incentives, the consumption, etc., more to match what you see on the left-hand side there. And that's where you know, the food system thinking comes in because there is no doubt, and I think it, it, it is fair to say, that the UK research community has, over the last decade or so, increased its kind of research power through good investment in terms of parts of this food system. So there's been lots of money to do with perhaps how we make plants produce more quickly or how we make livestock more efficient or how we actually understand a little bit more about diet or something like that. What we perhaps haven't done so much of is actually bring this all together in a food system. The Global Food Security Program has been doing that and doing that effectively, but interestingly, the Global Food Security's emphasis has perhaps been global, and, and, and what we're kind of perhaps um, beginning to suggest here, that here is an opportunity to do something national, not only is that useful in terms of where you might get investment, sometimes actually addressing things at the national scale can actually demonstrate the way to do things and actually show leadership. I mean, I've personally been involved in the UK's uh, response to antimicrobial resistance, in which five years ago, when we were sitting down with people like Sally Davis and uh, some of the leading vet, uh, vets in the world, there was a lot of accusation and counter-accusation about who was responsible. And then when one started getting a One Health type approach, and then when one tried to, to get, introduce targets for how much should be used in food production and how much one was seeing in food, initially the response was, this is a global problem and we're gonna be competitively disadvantaged by doing this compared to those countries in the world that don't do it. But then the UK showed leadership at organizations like Codex, setting the global standards Sally Davis went to the United Nations and gave the plenary talk on how the UK is responding to the antimicrobial challenge. And showing that national leadership has had big implications on the global standards and how the, the, the whole world is tackling that problem. So I think in that sense, there is an opportunity here through this money to actually address this phenomenon at the national level, but actually has the characteristics of what one is seeing globally. And therefore, you know, we should all be excited by that. We've probably all read you know, the Eat Lancet commissions which came out. And, and I think this is right, that food in the Anthropocene represents one of the greatest health and environmental challenges of the 21st century. One doesn't always get that many chances, so I will do a plug for a paper that I've just uh, uh, produced with a colleague of mine which came out um, last month. Uh, in a special edition of Current Biology about the Anthropocene. And in that, we argue that actually one, actually by understanding the role that food is making to the Anthropocene and how the Anthropocene is affecting food, putting human health at the heart of that thinking can be a way of addressing both human and planetary health. Um, and, and so I say, you know, the, the issue is we are all now, I think, hopefully, beginning to develop our ideas of how we can achieve what I think are these important papers. Whether you do agree 100% of them doesn't really matter. The fact is, if you agree with the trend of movement, either the planetary or this one which talks about, um, the, the, the other commission which talks about the health consequences of the current complex and highly um, uh, long supply chains, 
we should all think to ourselves, how in the UK are we going to respond to this to address a situation in which... I'm, one of the really pleasant things about, I think, working in food and food systems is, is many of us, when we're academics, and perhaps we bump into people in the street, we go to a party and they ask us what we do, and you kind of have to either make up something or be very careful about not boring them too much. And the fact is, when you say you work on food, and you're actually now going to potentially working on the UK food system, so that this might make people healthier, so we have less problems in terms of dietary illness, and, and, and the landscape that they see will stay healthy. You know, I challenge you to, well, you probably might go and find some people, who knows, but I challenge you to walk across that area out there and not find large numbers of people who say, I'm glad that people like you are looking at that, and I wish you well in trying to do something. So I, so I do think you know, it's a real privilege to be able to do this. So we did some work at the Food Standards Agency a few years back to do with Food Futures, in which we ran workshops across uh, the country, all the countries, and we also ran a lot of questionnaires to try and get a feel for questions like this, you know, what will dinner look like in 20 years' time? And, and, and when you looked through the, um, the data, these sort of four areas um, came out of it. And, 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 and again, this is things which are on people's mind. We're not saying we have a solution to them. These might be things that are worth thinking about or reading that report to help shape some of the kind of challenges and questions that have come before and thinking about how do I move to those. But so firstly, you know, we were beginning to explore that people turn around and say, actually, we like the convenience that the current food system gives to us. And you can see that in terms of the biggest trend in food consumption patterns in recent times is the increasing consumption of ready meals. And people like that convenience. But at the same time, they say, actually, we also think that that probably means we are not connected to food. And because we're not connected to food, things like food waste, food hygiene, food quality, it's just kind of, it, we're kind of relying on others to do this for us because we like the convenience. And the challenge, they are, argue, is we'd quite like a convenient world, but one in which perhaps oh, we are a bit more connected. So some of those things are a little bit more real to us. Some of the other things which came up, and many of you in the room would probably argue this is unfortunately happening pretty dramatically, but people said, you know, this issue of price and quality, in which we worry that as we move forward, um, society will become even more segmented. So there will be, um, and, and I don't mind saying, so I, so I live on the, on the south coast in the New Forest, so I, so I criticise people from my area. And people would say, the worried well living where you do will worry about quality and, and whatever price they'll pay it. And other parts of society will not be able to have access to that quality because if price goes up and we start paying the real cost of everything, then they will just be even more reliant on whatever the retail sector is offering them at the right price. And they worry that that could get worse. They think in 20 years' time that situation could be much worse than it is now. Also this question of what people want in terms of how people are making up their choices and to do and, and again this is it's interesting. You know what one's beginning to see now, and, and I think you see it amongst the sort of the Generation Z and the Greta Firmbergs and others, is this rise of the sort of the, the, the adolescent having very different thinking, in which their way of addressing climate change, because they don't drive into all of those things, is through diet. So that, that the way to respond to that is diet is the biggest contributor to climate change in their eyes and to them as an individual, so let's think about changing our diet. And so what people want, and then finally, who should do what, which is very interesting for us. The Food Science Agency is a non-ministerial department um, working in a regulatory regime where there is a desire to make regulation more effective, efficient, good for people, but also good for business. And the public were telling us with food, they quite like the idea of a nanny state looking after them, telling them how to 
look after themselves and tell business what business should be doing. It was quite a, well, I don't think it was a shocking finding, but it was quite an uncomfortable finding for government department uh, to be told this um, from the public. But again, you know, one has to be living in the world we live, the political world that we live. So again, this is potentially a challenge, this issue of, kind of people thinking that the food they're going to be eating is safe. Somebody is making sure it's of good standing, it's not going to make them ill and it's not going to damage the planet, etc. They don't want to be making that choice themselves. But again, if that's the wrong way forward, how does one actually begin to address that without the classic sort of deficit model of I know best, I tell you, you change what you do, which kind of rarely works. So, so there's some of the things that um, came up. So we know there's a whole range of factors influencing consumption. When we first went to um, people in, in, the, in, in high up in government about why this was an important area, um, their response, as you might imagine, was we've spent lots of money on aspects to do with food security. What's any different here? And actually, what difference will it make? And is what is the biggest challenge that is out there? And it became quite clear that the bigger challenges, and this is not to say it's the only way you should do, because it would be madness to just focus that much on one thing, but the biggest challenges are social. What people are consuming, what business models are out there, what supply chains are out there. You know, these are the things that need pretty dramatic disruption to address some of the planetary and human health mismatches that we were seeing earlier. Quite strange statistics here. So for, for every one pound that UK consumers spend on food, effectively UK taxpayers pay an additional pound of the costs associated with that. Now the knee-jerk reaction is double the price. <coughs> but the doubling the price has huge implications on demographics and socio-economics and those types of things. So that is, that's a solution, but actually is it the correct solution? But, but again, you look at these whole range of things in terms of um, you know, how, how do we kind of begin to address some of these things in a way that that isn't the statistic you know, that we see in the future. So there are several government departments um, that were involved in helping cast the votes as to why this became a strategic priority fund in the research councils. The own, my own non-ministerial department uh, are very interested in food you can trust, food is what it says it is, having access to healthy diets, etc. And, and, and so one of the big things that we raised was that whatever this new UK food system is, you know, it needs to be important to how do you regulate it, how do you regulate it efficiently, and ultimately, the very reason we were established in the year 2000 is it's a food system that the UK public trust. And they don't just trust the regulator, they trust the businesses, they trust what they're eating, they trust the restaurant, everything. So we have a high trust rating, but we wouldn't want a new food system which isn't trusted by the public or seen as trustworthy because you, know, you might argue that might not lead to sustainable change. The Department of Health have various challenges and targets to do with childhood obesity, for example. And interestingly, the Department of Health, in the five years that I've been doing my role, if we had raised the issue of trying to do some of these things five years ago, I don't, the Department of Health probably wouldn't have had it high enough up their priority list to say this is a something that the Department of Health would say as is a top of the draw strategic priority fund area. About 18 months ago that changed. Eight, about 18 months ago, Chris Whitty spoke with Ian Boyd and myself and said, you know, we are seeing some pretty dramatic effects on the NHS, which are dietary related. We have to do something. You know, we, we see the system now in a, not a good place, and how resilient is it, if it can get worse. And Public Health England, obviously at the heart of the, uh, the primary department, driving things like the Eat Well Plate, and linking that to sort of physical exercise, so it's not just a dietary thing in terms of maintaining your weight and staying healthy, and reaching out across a whole range of government departments and to a whole range of organisations. So, the, so the, the Public Health England aspect in terms of, you know, how do you make something like Eat Well or similar the norm? 
and something that actual people do, people produce, people sell, people sell in restaurants, etc. And then with DEFRA, again, a similar situation in which actually some of the radical change, which is something that I probably haven't mentioned, and, and perhaps I should mention a little bit more, is last time I looked, <coughs> We were still leaving the European Union. I don't know what the case will be now 15 minutes later. But, importantly, that level of external change is pretty dramatic, okay? So it means the issues to do with common agricultural policy, various directives, etc., all these incredible policy drivers influencing the rural landscape, influencing farming and food production, are absolutely essential for us moving forward. So that actually, if there is a radical change in terms of how common agricultural pro policy subsidies are spent, more towards the public goods, and there are ways of creating healthy food as being considered a public good. You know, is that a way forward in which actually one can have the investment, etc., that's necessary to, to enable perhaps the disruption needed to take you from one place into an alternative system in which the barriers are quite big without that kind of opportunity of push. So that brings us to why the £47.5 million research programme kind of really was able to capture the attention right across a whole range of government departments. And, and this is what we're going to be focusing in on today. I would say, I, I do think genuinely, the stars are aligning. The stars are aligning in the sense of, in some ways, what's happening in the political world, in which the disruptive external externalities, I would call it, in terms of all these things which actually, again, there's once in a lifetime opportunity to think about, does this enable us to think about things differently? Secondly, there's the Henry Dimbleby-led national food strategy, in which we've been working closely with Henry in the fact that, you know, as you can imagine, Henry producing a strategy, and to deliver that strategy's recommendations will hopefully rely on good quality and comprehensive evidence to do so. Henry, when I've spoken to him, would be, comes the stars have a line, because you don't often produce a strategy and at the same time as a £47.5 million pound research programme about gathering evidence, you know. Wow. Normally the strategy is published and delivered and the evidence comes along and suggests the strategy was wrong. So, you know, basically there's a unique opportunity again here. And as I said, coupled with the fact that I think it's recognised increasingly that we need to work at the systems level, I think it's increasingly recognised that um, we need to act and we need to act now. And as I said, these externalities and these other drivers mean the time is right. And so that's why today, uh, £25 million for these large consortia um, uh, is, the, is the first call of this um, program, bringing together production, consumption, health, environment, etc., characterising, bringing uh, and and hopefully transforming it. And I'll come back to that later. What about the scale of the challenge? I think it's worth saying that you know, don't, we, we, people have to realise this. And, and, and in fact, when I joined the Food Standards Agency five years ago, I, mean, I was shocked by some of these numbers. For instance, firstly, I didn't know at the time, but the food and drink industry is bigger than the cars and planes added together. Okay? So when you go to do a huge piece of research on something to do with planes or cars, you know, there are normally one or two businesses that you talk to. In the food and drink sector, there are approaching 600,000 businesses. Who are the voices of those businesses? Is it Tesco's? Is it a little barrow over there selling pre-packed foods? So it's a big challenge, employing 4 million people, generating 112 billion pounds. So huge aspects, and don't worry about the statistics on the right, that's to do with sort of crime and the number of incidents and that type of thing. But the, but, but the first thing to flag is the size of the business. The second big thing to flag is the complexity of the global stuff coming in. So this proposal is about UK consumers, but the global aspect it might be relating to where stuff comes from. And we import 37 billion pounds of agricultural commodities, and we only export about 14 billion. So we are a very, very significant 
um, trader in the world. We're the fifth biggest meat trader in the world. But actually, we import a lot more than we export. And some of our micronutrients are very linked into this. So if we take this next map, this is the global food map. The UK principally imports from six countries in the world, principally European. Will we be redrawing that map in the near future? And if we're redrawing that map in the near future, and we don't grow much fruit and veg, and we're short of fibre, and we're short of fruit and veg, and we get most of our security on fruit and veg from imports from Spain, what will that look like? Because it would be hard to imagine how you can build a healthy human food system and a good planetary food system without having that aspect, you know, part of it and considered. And so that's why taking some of the foresight type approaches, which are happening all the time, but most foresight reports on food tend to be at the global scale. We worked with an organisation called RAND and did a PESL, which enabled us, for instance, in this case, to look at how the UK food system might be um, changing. And, and this is what this particular drawing is about. And then we tried to create a kind of a, a, a multi-dimensional complex drawing here. This was homing in just on food safety, but it's illustrative, right? To try and illustrate to you that some of these big foresight things are great, but what does it mean nationally? So what this tries to tell you is what are the big issues to do with food safety in the UK of big global changes? And why is it like this? Well, what it is is big things, big circles, are highly connected, and red things are particularly significant in this issue. So therefore, if you were to show this diagram to a minister who then got very upset and said, why is this incredibly complex? What do you want me to do about it? You can say, large red circles. And then say, well, I'll, I'll work on the large red circles, and if I address those, I capture a lot of what's going on and a lot of the connectedness and things of significance. So this type of approach can kind of be useful in terms of beginning to identify where we should be. So I've, I'm within a minute of finishing, which is glad because I've got two slides, and I, I, I think the first thing to say is you'll see that there's kind of two biggish themes in the call, and um, you know, being, um, I mean, I, 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 I could almost turn around and say we've got to define and deliver, okay? And define and deliver is in terms of defining what this system will look like, and importantly, and why so many government departments are interested in it, and why it got strategic priority funding, is actually, and how to deliver. So this combination of defining what it needs to look like and how you're going to deliver that and what would it mean and how do we get people to do these things is critical. And we believe that actually because business as usual is nowhere near getting us to where we need to be and there has been lots of money spent which has done certain amounts but it hasn't perhaps done enough is the concept of you know, how do you disrupt and transform um, where you are, and, and, I, and I'll finish, in which um, many people in the room may have done these, but uh, many, many years ago, uh, I went on a university senior leadership course, and I went on a thing where they use Shakespeare plays to define leadership, and in that, we played, well, we had to play games in the style of Shakespeare to <coughs> illustrate the, the aspects of leadership. But the one thing I remember from that course which was um, a, a management company led by Richard Olivier, who is the son of Laurence Olivier, is the, the real use of what's called the call to the imagination, the, the muse of fire, preface to the Shakespearean play. And, and so therefore, to, to all of you, you know, I call to the imagination of the fact to show leadership through this money to actually define and deliver and disrupt and transform the UK food system. Thank you.